richer than they even thought the, par the parents were because it was a visible wealth. Uh, the drive-in was the idol of everyone. To go to the drive-in and to be an owner of the drive-in or the owner's son was, you know, right up there with, uh, you know, J. Paul Getty. And now today, here where the Keen drive-in movie used to be, we have this field with small wind rows of earth to show the places where the speaker stands used to be. Most of the drive-in movies are now gone because the land they were on simply became too valuable. But then again, so too are most of the grand old movie theaters, also gone, replaced by the Cine 1 and 2 type mall theaters. But movie going used to be more than just seeing a film. The theaters themselves used to be an event. To me, the most thrilling theater in all of New Hampshire was the State Theater in Manchester. This photograph was taken the night the state opened. Thanksgiving Eve, November 27th, 1929, the year that sound movies were introduced to America. Tickets that night were 40 cents. I felt so strong about the State Theater, and I knew, I knew it was going to be demolished. I went out and set up my 16-millimeter motion picture camera and shot some footage, and people came by. This was a Sunday morning. It was a beautiful, warm Sunday morning, and... Uh, they said, uh, you know, it's really a shame that that building's going to be torn down, but what can you do? You can't fight City Hall. I mean, people had given up on it. And if more of us, we even, we got a petition. We had, I think, six or seven hundred names to try to save that building. But it's very difficult to tell people what to do with their property in the bank, the bank owned on the State Theater. Gary Sampson is an historian, writer, photographer, and movie maker. He grew up in Manchester, and over the years, he documented many of the changes the city went through in the name of urban renewal. And when it comes to the State Theater, Gary has a personal connection with the building. You see, years ago, he worked there as an usher. I remember those warm summer nights walking up, and, um, and it was just, it, it was one of the most lovely facades in New Hampshire. It was it considered to be one of the most important Art Deco facades in all of New England. So from the time I was a child, I thought it, uh, of it as something important, something I liked, you know. I, was, I didn't know what the historical architectural significance was, but it was part of my life. I loved it because not only were the, the movies themselves exciting, but the theaters themselves were exciting. You know, before the movie would start, and you could kind of look up at the ceiling and look around, and I was just amazed. It was like being in a church, except that, you know, you could, you didn't have to shut up, at least at the beginning. Uh, before the film started. And um, I used to envision having the theater all to myself and be able to run up and down the aisles and go behind the stage, backstage, to see what was there. And um, I never knew that one day I'd end up working in a movie theater and be able to uh, have the theater all to myself. So that was kind of nice. It was kind of a lot of fun. This is historian Robert Perot, who also worked as an usher at the State Theater, along with Gary Sampson. All of my adult life, my friendships were made in the movie theater. My, my friend Robert Perot, who works in the movie theater, and, um, and we've continued a friendship to this day, worked on projects together. Um, the, um, the ushers, who are generally, you know, were, were, were men, were, were, were boys, teenagers, dated, the, as we refer, referred to them at the time, the candy girls. So I made wonderful relationships. Um, and we had a lot of, you know, really swell, no doubt the person most associated with the State Theater was Edward Bernard Hickey, who for over 40 years had managed the place. He was a, you know, a really a very noble man. Uh, a little on the gruff side. I mean, he, he was not the kind of person who's going to put his arm around you and say, I love you, but he had a, he had a tremendous heart. And he, he was sort of, you know, the surrogate father for all of us, for the ushers and the candidates. In a way, you know, there was a sense of stability there. And um, I, I probably should share with you that uh, uh, he was such a rich uh, and knowledgeable person about the history of the theaters. I, I, the Manchester Historic Association said, we should do an interview with, with Mr. Hickey about his life in the theaters and they had asked someone to interview him and that person did not show up and i got a call gary we know you know mr hickey and you're knowledgeable would you sit and and 
talk with Mr. Hickey. So I did a two-hour tape interview with him. The next day, he died of a heart attack. They tore the State Theater down a month after Edward Bernard Hickey died, February 1978. Eleven years later, they tore the Notre Dame Bridge down, too. The Notre Dame Bridge was the bridge you drove over when you came to see a movie at the State Theater. It was right around the corner. Over the years, I rode over the Notre Dame Bridge thousands of times. See, it had this egg crate steel surface, and when you drove over it, you could see right through it like you were riding on glass. It was real scary. Well, you can't do that anymore, because in 1989, they cut it down. The Notre Dame Bridge had spanned the Merrimack River more than half a century. Just about the same amount of time the State Theater lasted, 50 years. And literally thousands of people remembered its creation and its demise. Of course, with the new bridge, traffic flows more easily into Manchester these days. But some might say that the reason the traffic came into the city at all was because of places like the State Theater. Today, there is nothing in downtown Manchester to remind us that the State Theater ever existed. But across town, on the campus of St. Anselm's College, there is this. Here, outside the Dana Humanities Center, rests the head of the Greek Muse of Comedy, and yes, this is the same head that once formed the apex of the facade of the State Theater. It sits now on the ground, like the Statue of Liberty in the last scene of Planet of the Apes. It was really sad, and I still dream about it sometimes. I still dream of being in there and in those rooms that are now just, you know, part of history, these imaginary rooms that no longer exist. 